Keep in mind, Druids never wrote anything about themselves. Druidry was a complete world tradition. And the main reason why was because, you know, as I said, you know, we deal with multiple worlds and multiple timelines. Any action that is taken can have an effect on any one of the other worlds. There are 33 worlds in the Druidic universe. In th that exist in three separate realms. One of the realms is here in what we call the human world, or the human realm. And that is where we, we work, we struggle, we laugh, we, you know, we have our lives, but the main point of this realm is to learn, is to experience and to gain wisdom. Then there is the realm called Kermanag. Kermanag is what you find after this world. It's a place where we all go once we finish here, we get to go there, we party, we have fun, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we hang out with our friends until our next spiritual contract comes up if we are so called to return to this world. Now the Druids uh, were very much in alignment with the Celts. And in the Celtic tradition, births were Greek because the idea was you left this amazing place to come to some place that was cold and unpleasant yeah. and, you know, and, and deaths were celebrated because the person was returning to where, you know, they would have joy and never have hunger and, you know, never have pain and they could just, you know, enjoy themselves. The third realm is called Sidhe. And Sidhe is the realm of the gods. It's the realm of the fairy folk. And it is tremendously, you know, exciting, you know, whenever anybody had a chance to have a connection with that realm. Now that realm, all the realms overlap. And there are points that it becomes, the barrier between them becomes thin, such as the point of ley line. And there are certain sacred spaces that could be brought into, you know, focusing the energy, which in the Buddhist tradition would be the circle of stones. The most famous one being Stonehenge, but there are many, many, many stone circles. And each one is brought into being as a focal point for that energy. So um, let me go back to the, the four pillars. Uh, there's multiple lifetimes, multiple worlds, that the spirit is eternal, or that spirit exists in all things. And when I say all things, we mean all things, whether it's there is spirit in a live plant as well as there is a spirit in a plastic plant. It's just a different form. And yet there is a consciousness that exists in all of them. The last of the four pillars is you honor your ancestors. And the Celts had a very strong, you know, your clan was who you were. Your clan was your people. And the family lineage was tremendously important because community was so important. You only survive because you are a part of community. If you were out there by yourself in the elements, you weren't going to make it. So your family was there with you, your family supported you, your clan was there for you. And so the importance of holding your ancestors in a place of honor because of the fact that they are not gone from you, that they're right there, they're watching you. you know, it's, um, somebody once said that you know, if you were going to do something, you have to consider, would you do it if your grandmother was standing next to you? Because she is. Yeah, in, in our tradition, they are. They are with us at all times. They are available for us to ask questions. And they will answer because we, we believe that. We have faith in them. So the idea when we look at you know, the foundation of the Druidic tradition, that it rests very much on and you know, other worlds and ancestry, that on the deep connection with the natural world because there's spirit in all of it, it's very much a shamanic type of practice. So, you know, when we talk about shamanism, pretty much, it's very much the same as Druidry. And it allows us to go into that place of, that we are not separate from what we do. We are not separate from, you know, the stones. We're not separate from the river. We're not separate from the air. Or each, other. or each other. That we are, in fact, one being, one consciousness, but we're manifested in separate okay. suits, separate containers, because we each have an agreement. We're all from the same source, but we each have our own spiritual agreement 
of something that they're coming to this life to do. Druids were always focused on gathering wisdom. There were three levels of druids. When you began your study, which took 20 years, you started off as a bard. And a bard was an entertainer, a bard was a singer, a bard was a minstrel, a bard was a storyteller. But the most important thing was that the bards were actually the early internet. <laughs> the bards were the ones that would take information from one place to another, present it in an entertaining fashion, but it allowed one community to learn what was happening in another community. So that that way, if something politically was really stirring up, and it's like, okay, you know, looks like we're gonna have a political change here, the chieftains are getting together, we need to know about this. If war was impending, it was the bards who would go and tell stories about the future war that was going to happen and who was going to be involved. The other thing that the bards did was they would go out and they would gather information and they would create them to be stories that they would tell. It's like, oh, well, in this village over here, there you know, was a white cow born. And then they would tell a story about that or if a particular king was doing something foolish. They would, you know, they would make up a story, but all of those stories came back to the druids. And the druids would gather all the information because also it was a way for them to find out how the laws were working. Were the people complaining in this region that some of the laws were unfair? And so on a regular basis, they would call all the bards in. Usually about every two years, they would call all the bards in. And they would discuss all the laws. And the druids would go over every single law, how it was being, you know, implemented, if there were any problems with it, and if there were changes that needed to be made, they changed the laws. The new laws were given to the bards, and the bards would take the laws out and let everybody know what the new laws were. The druids held a lot of power, and, and it was often very difficult to figure out why. Before they were in the UK and in the British Isles, they were in Galicia, Spain. Before they were in Galicia, Spain, they were in Portugal. Before they were in Portugal, there are reports of them in Russia, there are reports of them, I mean, and the artifacts always, you know, they go backwards, they predate. In the, you know, the British Isles, it goes back to about 500 BC. There are artifacts that predate them in Galicia, Spain, Celtic mm -hmm. artifacts. There are also that predate them that are in Portugal. And so wherever the Celts, who are very nomadic people, wherever they ended up, there always seemed to be the Druids. And the Druids just sort of came in, wore their white, and it was said that if the white robes of the Druid appeared on a battlefield, the battle stopped. The commanders had to come forward. They had to explain to the Druid why they were fighting, and it was up to the Druid to decide if that battle was to continue. Let's do that again. <laughs> if the Druid said no, everybody went home. Yeah. So what you're saying is, is the Druid was not just a spiritual, no, he was a political. Absolutely. Person as well. They were and so was there a hierarchy? Because it's yes. saying that there's these three different groups mm -hmm. and the other two. Yeah. So there was there like a top there? there was there was talk <laughs> about and different historical texts talk about different things regarding the hierarchy. The the groups essentially um, work more as a council. Mm -hmm. And while the most learned would be considered the head of the council, but also keep in mind that the spirit realm and the ancestors were also considered active parts of that council. Mm -hmm. And so um, the opportunities, you know, if you, if you became a bard and you just wanted to stay a bard forever, fine, that was, that was your calling, you like that. Then, if you decided that as you moved through Bard, now keep in mind, the Bardic training was probably the longest part of the training, because, okay, um, anybody here hear of Canterbury, Chaucer's Canterbury Tale? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know how big it is. Picture memorizing it. Mm -hmm. Acting out all the parts. And oh boy, all the parts? All the parts. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> or memorizing Hamlet word for word, without ever having read it. You had to listen to it over and over again. It was repeated to you. You repeated it to yourself. And then you had to be able to, you know, the bards had to be able to deliver 
on that scale. It was said that a you know a very proficient bard could tell a story that would go three four days, they, or they sing a song. They couldn't read, or they couldn't read. Or they could read. Okay. They were they were definitely literate, but it was forbidden for them to write down what it was that you know the lessons. The idea was that someone could read something and have the knowledge, but not the wisdom. Mm -hmm. They felt that what they did was so special, and what they did, the, their ability to work with energetic fields, their ability to work with nature and create change in it, that was considered tremendously powerful. And like I said, the theory is, is that what you do in one realm can have a ripple effect into 33 other worlds. And the more significant that somebody plays with the balance, you know, the more damage that they can do. Then the club will be spirits. Do you, do you <laughs> like the people that have the power now don't have to have wisdom? <laughs> there, there were three places. Mm -hmm. There was the here, the physical, and then the very... Yeah, there's the here. But where the 33 other levels? In yeah, there, the 33 worlds exist. They're sort of dispersed within those three realms. Okay. How many in each? It's not specific. Okay. How many in each? And some of them, because they could exist in an, a place of overlap, they would actually exist in both at the same time. Okay. The worlds are constantly moving, so there are times when they may move into and out of different realms. So mm -hmm. the idea of this constant respect for not just the balance of this place, not just the balance of this event, but the balance on the cosmic level, it made it a tremendously serious practice and a serious work. Are, are there bad levels like where evil people go? There is no real good or evil in the yeah. tradition. Because it's balance. It is about good or evil is, and, and when we look at the, the three moral laws are here, and, and thank you for bringing that up. The three moral laws are, you know, one of them is uh, do no evil. <laughs> now, <coughs> evil is about intention. Mm -hmm. In their eyes, to do evil is to intentionally create imbalance. To do something that triggers a, a series of events that will cause an imbalance either, you know, to one side or the other. Because it is in that place where everything is even. You know, that's, that's where they believe, where we believe, that things should remain. And because it's constantly in motion, it's not about, okay, we're balanced, we're going to stay balanced. Everything is in flux, so that every action has a reaction. You know, every, you know, we all know Newton's law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that is very much in the Jewish tradition, because it's like, okay, an, an evil act might lead to something good. Or it's a, a horrific act may need to happen because there is a benefit that is in a, on a bigger scale than we can understand. You know, in nature, a tsunami is no more bad than a rainbow is good. They're both simply events. And so by viewing, even within ourselves, you know, we have, we each have light and shadow. There's light and shadow in everything. It's about intention. It also is the fight valiantly in battle. Which means, if you have something that you believe in, if you have a cause that you feel really strongly about, do it. Engage it, you know, really put your heart behind it. Because of the fact that, you know, if, if you have something you believe in, no half measures. You know, well, I'll believe in that, but somebody else can take care of making that happen. No, you gotta get involved. And it really doesn't matter what you believe, whether you're, you know, the most liberal liberal or the most conservative conservative. If you believe it, do it. And that is in the face of those who disagree with you. Because if we don't all stand in our own integrity, if we don't stand for what we believe in, you know, there's, there's no authenticity. And where there's no authenticity, you can't have true balance. If everybody is, is not being themselves, not being true to themselves. There are people who I, I would really stand in opposition to, you know, how they may view something, or they may stand in opposition to how I view something, but we can still be friends because we can respect one another. 
I know they're going to fight as hard for their cause as I'm going to fight for mine. And we can agree. It's like, you know what? I respect the fact that you committed, and I know you respect the fact that I'm committed, so we're going to go see a movie that has nothing to do with either side. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. It's also worship the gods is one of the moral laws. It doesn't matter what god, but worship your god. Be fully committed to your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, the, the relationship between humanity and spirit is, is, it is an agreement, it is the ultimate form of balance, you know, and I know that when I'm in that place of spirit, when I'm in that, just that, that beautiful sweet spot, and I know many of you have experienced that, when you're in that one place and in that one moment where you are just so connected with spirit, and that is when you're in absolute balance. I mean, I know for me, nothing in that moment matters but me and spirit. Mm -hmm. And I, I walk with that. You know, I, I do my best. You know, some days it's a little bit easier than others. Some days I'm a little better at it than others. But being in that place of, okay, I'm really feeling, you know, because I, I look for that sense of imbalance within myself. And when I feel it, I know that it's my responsibility to do something about it. Recently, I turned off my cell phone for two and a half days. And I went up to my cabin, and I closed the doors, and I just stayed there by myself because there were some things that were going on inside of me that I wasn't able to use my tools to bring myself back into balance. So I needed to do something, you know, I needed to take it to the next level of okay, I gotta do a complete withdrawal and go back within myself because you know I, I need to have a conversation with me and Creator. Mm. And by doing that, it allowed me to help bring myself back into my place of balance so that I could do what I do. It is, you know, it, it's a really um, an amazing tradition because, as I said, the, the Druids kind of came in and most people couldn't quite figure out why all of a sudden they were the advisors of kings and chieftains and generals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the king always had Druids in their court. The colleges, you know, the Druids set up colleges to educate the nobles. And some of them decided to become Druids, some of them didn't. But they were the source of education. They were also the source of any sort of judgment that needed to be done. You know, if there was any type of arbitration, there was always a rule there. And when, you know, in the Celtic tradition, the number of colors you could wear was sort of a, a marker as to where you were in the society. A, a somebody who was basically a peasant could wear one color. Mm. You know, a landowner would wear two. A lower level noble would wear three. The king wore six. A druid wore five. So that meant that the druids were given a very high rank in in the society. Yes? Does that mean to get the best place for the guards so that's why the best place for the guards are? they wore the extra guards? Uh, yeah. You know, they, they were allowed to wear the colors and by jumping around and, you know, being very festive. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was one of the reasons why they were allowed so many mm -hmm. colors. And so the second level of Guru would be Ovate. Probably the best description of an Ovate would be Merlin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Ovates were the magic users. They were the, um, they were the community healers. They were the uh, prophets. They were, you know, those who went out into maybe one or two communities, and they would take care. They would be responsible for taking care of the needs of those communities. They would, you know, arbitrate the debates. Uh, they would direct the ceremonies. They would, give, you know, they would rule midwives. They would be the birthers. They would assist with those who died. Um, they were, you know, they would be, you know, if you wanted to say, you know, it's like, well, what's next year's season going to be, you know, the Druid would, or the Ovate would go, okay, well, let me take a look and let me go into this meditation trying to see what next year's uh, rain is going to be like, so we can prepare. Or, you know, if there was an issue with the weather, now, 
keep in mind that in balance is everything. So when a druid works with the weather, what we do is like, okay, what is the local pattern? And we actually, it's really interesting because if I'm going to do any type of work, it's like, okay, weather channel. Man, I bet they wish they had this. Because <laughs> you look at what are the weather patterns, not just for the immediate area. What are the weather patterns in the county, in the state, in the country? How is it, you know, and, and once again, physics. You know, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It simply changes form. And so in considering, it's like, okay, if I want the wind to shift to this point, this is what the wind is doing here. I've got to take that, let's move that over that way, all right? But then, you know, we've got to move out for global weather patterns. Then we've got to consider for solar winds. Then we have to consider the movement of the stars and of the planets. All of those have a part to play in even, you know, the most moderate of local weather. So it's about always maintaining balance. If you're going to shift something, it's like, okay, that's got to be in balance here. Okay, that's got to be in balance there. This is here. So it could take, you know, a long time in, in Druid tradition to do any type of work with weather. And it is considered something that it is better to learn to work with the weather you have than to attempt to change it. Mm. So the idea of this absolute respect for nature in the natural world, you know, it's we, we are not the directors, we are the, we're the stewards. And if you look at it, that, you know, as to whether humanity is sort of watching over the world or whether the world is watching over humanity, who, which one can survive without the other? So if we consider that nature can survive very well without us, <laughs> It is the idea that nature watches over us, and we are grateful. And you know, one of the one of my favorite <laughs> images is Gaia, and this is you know it's an amazing representation. And you know, you can come and look at it, and there's like little representations of all the creatures of the world, and she's very peaceful. She is almost sleepy. With and, you know, I always view nature in that way, that it's just kind of moving along at its pace. I feel the vibration of it, and it's like, oh, okay. You know, and then every once in a while, change has to happen. Maybe it's an earthquake. Maybe it's a mudslide. Maybe it's a tsunami. And then it goes back into balance, its own balance. So the idea that we are, we bear witness to what is happening around us so that we can learn and gain wisdom from the experience of it. You know, after the earthquake back in 89, that was you know, devastating to many, and there were many lives lost. And it was an opportunity that the absolute best of humanity was shown. People called into tiny little spaces to save the lives of people they had never met. Mm -hmm. And the comfort, it's like, you know, even in the darkest of times, there is always light. And that's the balance point. We have an opportunity to always see the best, and the worst, and to understand there are just two different events. So is the ovate, you know, which as a healer, you know, that would be the position of the ovate. So I would primarily be an ovate, and I chose to move into the next level, which is full blue. The color of the bard is primarily blue. The color of the ovate is blue. The color of the druid is white. And when you moved into that place of wearing white, that meant that you were not going to be traveling around much at all. It meant that you were going to be in a place that you would be studying, learning, doing meditations to cross between realms and seek information. And that when you come in, your job to work on going what of all this that you've brought in, all this information, how do you do it on it? And sometimes it was it could be very hard. Maybe a particular, you know, battle, even though it can cause a lot of death, that means it's a habit. 
And so the dealers would secure them. Point no, this more needs to happen. Because of what is in the bigger picture. And it's always about what is the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. What is, if we take away the emotion of the moment and look at where this moment's going to be, druids uh, were actually a very interesting <coughs> phenomenon for Julius Caesar. <laughs> and Caesar was fascinated with the druids, with what they did, with how they just kind of came in and became, you know, authorities and were given great power. So the druids were invited to Rome often. And, you know, he would wine them and dine them and, you know, try to ask them questions and they would just smile and nod and, oh, this is nice, okay, yeah. All right, you know. And, and they always seemed very reserved. And Rome during that time was not exactly reserved. <laughs> so the idea that, you know, there were these excesses that the druids never seemed to really get that involved. And he finally proposed to them that they join the Roman Empire because, of course, Rome, the Roman Empire was going to last forever. And, you know, he felt that it was a great mix. And the Druids said, well, we're sorry, but Rome will fall. Julius Caesar took that as a threat. It wasn't. It was merely them saying what was going to happen. But he viewed them, if they were not going to be his allies, they were too powerful to be enemies. So he set about deciding that he had to destroy the Druids. This was something the Druids foresaw. And the fact that they knew that many of their people were going to be destroyed. They also knew that there were ways that they could save a good chunk of what they knew. They weren't as concerned about losing the people as they were about losing wisdom. And losing, mm -hmm. you know, because nothing was written down. And which ultimately was a wise thing because then Caesar's soldiers came in and they tried to find texts and poems that they could destroy and there were none. So uh, they separated the bards into bardic colleges. And the bardic colleges became, you know, just known for places of entertainers and jesters and storytellers. So when Rome and the soldiers came through to destroy the Druids, they let the bombs alone, thinking that they were nothing but, you know, clowns. Yeah, clowns. Yeah, you yeah. know, that they were the clowns. And so they weren't viewed as the threat. The threat was anyone who wore white. And because the Ovates were a major part of the communities, they had to have them you know, destroyed as well. And in order to discredit and get people to agree with destroying a group, historically, the best way to do it is to demonize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, there were rumors created and stories created that the groups did human sacrifices. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There have been many university research teams that have all gone to wherever the groups have been and they have never found evidence that the Druids have made sacrifices. In fact, the only sacrifice that Druids performed were there was a white bull that was sacrificed during one of the festivals. And that's it. And it was humanely, it was humanely sacrificed, very much in the tradition of Palau. Mm -hmm. Where if the life of an animal is taken, it's treated in a reverent way. And really, the rest of the druids, for any other druid other than the one who was specifically trained for this, we were denied the ability to hold a weapon. Druids were not allowed to hold a dead weapon. So the idea that, you know, we're doing all these sacrifices was just wasn't really true. And that has been confirmed by study after study after study. But when you have a group that doesn't write anything and the Druids knew that they would go underground for a very, very, very long time. And they did. There was a symbol of a Druid that was of particularly high rank. And it was called a Druid Dust. 
Druid's egg was a stone that fit in the palm of a hand that was shaped like an egg, looked sort of like an egg, kind of mottled surface. And it had to come from the earth. And it came to that particular druid when they reached rank that the earth itself was made. And so, if any druid was found to have a druid's egg, they were not arrested, they were killed immediately. And the druid's egg was taken. And it was taken as proof that they had been killed. Uh, one druid was actually killed in a court because they had an egg on them. Because the idea is also is that the druid egg is something that if you took it into a court situation or in any type of a contract negotiation, it would give you benefit. It would also, you know, be very was used in healing. It would absorb illness within itself, transmute it, and then release it to the universe. So that was a very, you know, powerful thing. And Caesar found out about it, and he said, anybody with that, you take them down immediately. So many, many, many years and lifetimes passed, and Druidry remained underground. In fact, in Galicia, Spain, um, they, the Druids went up into the mountains, and the soldiers couldn't find them, and they said, fine, we won't come get you, but you cannot come back down into the cities. And so communities you know, were up in the mountains and lived for years. Pope John Paul II, before he died, one of the things that he did was he lifted the, the bounty on Druids. Mm -hmm. How long it took that long? long? It took that it's long for something. the church to formally say that Druids would no longer be hunted. But he did. Well, women <laughs> still aren't in the church. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think? We're still fighting the civil rights. It's almost the same thing. Yeah. 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 So you know, it's and it, it is interesting <laughs> though that you will never find mistletoe in a Catholic church <laughs> because of the fact that mistletoe is the sacred, most sacred plant of the Druids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Episcopals so, have it. When the Druid, what was the? Look at her basket. Yeah. Look at my basket. There's mistletoe in it. What was the reasoning for them, mm -hmm. for the Pope to finally do that? I mean, it, ultimately, it was kind of between him and spirit. But I think it was in my heart what I believe. Okay. I, Oh, which is why it's mistletoe. Isn't it something that kills like, the plants that it kind of gets ashes to? Um, tell you what, let me answer that question a second. Okay. My feeling is, and in speaking with other druids, it's just that he was told at that point, this is now the time for you to do this, because there's been a huge um, upsurgence in the Druidic tradition. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, there's a lot of people interested in it. There are, you know, groups that are now, you know, giving it sort of a rebirth. Mm -hmm. And the order of bards over had a huge increase <laughs> in people interested in the well, information. And lots. if you would like to learn about Druidry, they are one of the most amazing sources. They have podcasts, it's very cool. So the website is druidry.org. So if you would like to really get some very cool information, uh, you can go to that website and they've got just awesome stuff. So uh, to answer your question, yes, mistletoe is a, it's considered a parasitic plant. And in a way it's, it's sort of also symbiotic because the plants, certain plants will have mistletoe growing on them, while other plants right near it will not. So it's believed that there's an agreement between that plant, that particular tree, and the mistletoe. Mistletoe has been studied for helping cancers. Mm -hmm. It has been used for helping women in, in difficult births. It's been used for intestinal issues. There pretty much is almost nothing that mistletoe has not been used for. Now, mistletoe is also a tremendously powerful neurotoxin. Oh. And if taken incorrectly, if you don't know how to titrate that correctly, mm -hmm. bad things happen. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, you really have to know what you're doing. It demands respect, just like any other plant medicine. And they learned how to manage it, how to communicate with it, how to be able to utilize it in all its different parts to be able to be tremendously healing. And in fact, the word mistletoe means all healing. Mm. So, you know, and the idea of mistletoe at Christmas was actually the idea of healing and peace. It's the belief was that, you know, in the presence of mistletoe, there is nothing but love. Ah, yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, or an embrace, or the idea that you know, when you were in the field of it, if you were respecting it, you know, you do not argue, you do not use, you know, you, you don't have angry energy near it. There's nothing, and it emanates a feeling of love, a feeling of healing, a feeling of awareness. How how did you get on the path of doing you in your life? <laughs> How did you find it, and what brought you to it? Um, I've been a Jew since I was about four. Mm -hmm. um, it was an awareness of a connection that I had with the natural world, that I was always more comfortable, you know, on the playground, I was more comfortable sitting next to a tree mm -hmm. than I was with anybody else that when the storms would happen and, you know, we moved everywhere in Oklahoma and the big thunderstorms and all of that, it was all I could do not to run outside <laughs> because it was, I felt it moving through me. I felt this deep connection with everything and, you know, and there were spirits that would come to me. Mm -hmm. And whenever I, if I was out somewhere, if I needed help with something, there always seemed to be an animal that was present. And I always, you know, I, I was never harmed by animals in the wild. Um, when I was in high school, we went on a field trip and there was, we're up at the Pinnacles. And we were hiking and along one of the, next to one of the paths, we walk up and there's a rattlesnake laying like right across the path. Well, you know, the guy, he's a guide, he's like, okay, well, you know, we're gonna wait. And, you know, he kind of like, through a couple of stones toward it and so <laughs> this slope. And so the snake kind of, you know, moved up on the slope and he's like, okay, everybody very quietly. And without even thinking, I put myself between them and the rattlesnake. And I knew with absolute certainty I wasn't going to be bitten. It wasn't going, it wouldn't attack me. And I got chewed out royal by the, the guide and he's like, you never get a run of a rattlesnake. And I just kept saying, but it won't hurt me. And, and I knew that. And as I grew and, you know, it wasn't until I was a teenager that I heard the word druid for the first time. And I learned about it and it's like, that's me. That's what I've always been. And it, it's, it's about the connections. It's about, that's great history mm -hmm. you know, just realizing that we are in fact everything and nothing. That is the ultimate creative moment when we realize we are everything and nothing at exactly the same time. And that can be difficult to wrap your head around. Because, you know, we view those two things as being on opposite ends, but they're not. You know, if we go to a state that is so expansive that it includes everything, we are, in fact, nothing. Because we're everything, we are no longer ourselves. So the idea that we can live our lives in that place of feeling connection, but not attachment, of acceptance of what happens in our lives without adding a story to it, that it doesn't need to mean anything more than the fact that we're here again. What is it that we're meant to learn? In the Druid tradition, when we leave this world, no matter what form we've been in, whether we human, a stone, an animal, that we don't leave with guilt. We don't leave with regret. All we leave with is wisdom. And that wisdom becomes this perfect gift that we take to the great tree. You know, in the Jewish tradition, we talk about the world tree. And in the Mayan tradition, it's called Rachakai. 
Many traditions speak of a huge sort of celestial being that will tell the truth. And when we complete whatever it is we're meant to complete in this life, we take all of that wisdom and we give it to the world too. And through that, it becomes a part of the fabric of the universe, which means that our experiences make the entire universe a more compassionate and noble place. And I think that's also that. Somebody once asked me if I've known her for ever, and I said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, why? And I said, because then everything that I have suffered, I will have suffered for nothing. Everything that I've endured, everything that I could give to the universe, I never get to give. And I would never want that. You know, there's been a lot of stuff that I've experienced, both with light and with shadow. You know, in love and in horrible fear. And to know that every single thing that I suffered, everything that I survived, makes the entire universe and every being in it wiser. So that they don't have to be through it. Which ultimately, as each one gives their gifts and as we each cycle back around in their life to get more gifts, everything, every tree we ever shed is going to feed the spirit of someone else. People that you will never meet, but that you are connected to. That what our ancestors experienced made us better beings. You know, it's sort of, I guess, like spiritual evolution. And it's not that we don't care. Spirits care a lot. So we understand that to create an attachment, we have to look at what is it that we attach to. Do we attach to a person, or do we attach to the story that we created about that person? Do we attach to a dream of what we would do if we won the lottery, or do we deal with the fact that, you know, there's some stuff missing in there? I always say nobody ever actually wants to win the lottery. They just want the money to do the stuff that they would do if they won the lottery. <laughs> Nobody's going to say, it's like, well, I'm going to win the lottery and never spend a penny of it. No, they're going to say, it's like, well, if I won the lottery, I'd, I'd pay off all my bills. I would, you know, have a nice home. I would, you know, do all of these things. So it's the things that we want, the things that we're attached to, not the way we get it. And if we can just figure out, well, there's certain things that I'm going to get, and I'm going to do my part, the Spirit's going to do its part, and if it is my destiny, darn right I'm going to have that convertible whatever, you know, that convertible Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> convertible Mustang. But if, you know, and if you want the convertible Mustang, it's like, okay, what do you need to do to, to make it happen? And while I would really love a convertible Mustang, I can accept that maybe I don't have to have it. I can understand the difference between what I want and what I need. And that's like the best part for me, that's the best part of Creator, is that Creator knows the difference between what I want and what I need, especially when I don't. Because if I say, you know, it's like, you know what, I really need this in my life. I need, I need health in my life. I want health in my life. And it's really hard when you're sick. It's really hard when your body's in pain to be able to hold on to balance and see any purpose in this. You know, universe, it, why is this necessary for the balance for, for pain to exist? Because without pain, we never understand pleasure. Without pain, we don't learn to grow from it. We don't learn that we can be bigger than what we ever dreamed possible because it's in those points of pain when we really have to depend on faith. When we really have to depend on what is beyond the physical world. That, you know what, I may be in pain today, but I may not be in pain tomorrow. And if I'm in pain tomorrow, maybe I'm not going to be in as much pain. You know, maybe my heart's broken, you know, today. But maybe tomorrow it'll be a little less broken. And maybe it'll be a little less broken the day after. If I can understand 
that everything that I am experiencing is a part of a tapestry that is so much more massive than I could ever conceive of. And I often say I've seen God's job doing what I can do, with a few people smile along the way, you know, love creator, and be in balance. And when I feel like I'm not, then, then I look for how I can go back into balance. Biggest trick is figuring out when you're not. You know, my animals will react to me differently <laughs> when I'm not in balance. They will, my dog will actually, you know, kind of, you know, not be quite so chummy with me. And, you know, when I look and I can see in them that they're reacting, my cat will go sit in the shower. It's <laughs> like, really? Really? I was, at one point, I was very sick and hallucinating, and it was an energetic process, and it was all kinds of interesting. My cat stayed in the shower for like three days. <laughs> she didn't want to come out. She didn't want anything to do with me. And when it passed, she came out and, you know, was around me. So, you know, and we all have, we have those people trusted in our lives. We have, you know, the you know, that, that person who is going to be there no matter what for that person. And then, you, you know, you look at each other and, you know, and Tom, I'm sure you know, without her even saying a word, when Mary is not in her happy place. Oh. <laughs> Everybody knows <Yeah>. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but, Don't fix a lot. <laughs> The idea is that we can do that for each other. That that's what we do in order to help maintain balance when somebody is not in a happy place. And we know it, we can counterbalance them. You know, when, when you know, Dottie is just like frazzled and, and running around on Sunday, you know, getting everything in, and Corky just like, okay, what do you need? What do you need? You know, and she makes sure that Dottie has her water, Good. make sure that her announcement mm -hmm. is up there so she can be able to, to do that. You know, that's that's not that's not conscious. That's like, you know, that's like automatic. You know, Corky knows when Dottie needs water without Dottie even having to ask for it. She knows because there's balance. There's balance, you know, I mean, and everything tilts and relationships always have that, you know, that seesaw type of thing. But in the center, it's balance. The ends may shift, but at the heart of it is balance. At the heart of your group is balance. It's acceptance that sometimes the saying I use is life is fun until it isn't and it sucks until it doesn't. <laughs> and no matter how fun it is, at some point it's going to suck. And no matter how much it sucks, it's going to be fun again. But it's about letting go of the need for no, it's always got to be great, it's always got to be wonderful. I always have to be in my highest spiritual place. No, you don't, because mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to try to hold yourself to a standard that we weren't meant to keep. We were meant to be angry. We were meant to be upset sometimes, because that's how we learn to find balance. We were meant to lose our temper. We were meant to get irritated when somebody cuts us off, because it's in those moments that we get to practice choice. Dudes are all about choice. Choice that allows you to be in your authentic place. Choice that allows you to be one with nature. There are no good guys or bad guys in nature. The bunny is not a good guy because it's cute. You know, the you know, the, the wolf is not a bad guy because it'll eat the bunny. Everything is in its proper order. Everything is in balance. And as humans, there's a tendency to want to have a good guy or a bad guy. Um, one of the, hmm? No, no, I was saying sometimes it just is. Yeah. There's no, it nothing just around it. It is. is. Yeah? Oh. So that was something I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah. And, and when we beat ourselves up because maybe, you know, we've got a nice time to And maybe, you know, we got irritated and we were tired. And maybe we weren't quite as patient. And maybe, you know, we trying to, you know, debate something in a group and, and we're getting like really irritated because they don't understand. <laughs> Accepting that everyone is a divine being having a human experience. Accepting that everyone has that 
natural balance within them. Not just a few, everyone has that capacity. And if somebody seems to be choosing something that's completely out of balance, maybe it's in balance for them. You know, somebody has to be the jerk. Somebody has to be, you know, really, honestly, somebody has to do it. <laughs> but in our tradition, it takes a really long time. So, you know, but we, it is always about coming from that place of absolute respect. And if it is viewed and it's like, you know what, there's no.